I had the perfect marriage, and then I screwed it up. That's right. 15 minutes after saying my vows, I made a mistake. Now, here's the deal. I uh, have been waiting to get married to Tabitha for a long time. You guys met her earlier tonight. She's incredible. And I always wanted to have the perfect marriage. Like, that was, like, my thing. I was like, I want to marry the perfect girl, have the perfect marriage. And on our wedding day, we got married in the morning because it saved us a ton of money. Uh, everything seemed perfect. I mean, we were, we were having the perfect day. It was 72 degrees and sunny, no humidity on that May day, uh, May 17th. Uh, we had all of our friends and family there. We had said our vows. No one had screwed up. No one had fainted. Everything had worked out. And I figured that from that point on, things were going to go completely smoothly. And yet, I messed up. And this is what I did. As we were driving to the reception from the wedding venue, uh, and we are like, just like so happy, I started playing with my wedding ring. See, I never really had any kind of uh, jewelry. I had my ears pierced, but I didn't have any kind of jewelry. That's right, ears pierced right here. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> I don't have them anymore, but I did at one point. Uh, but I had this ring on, and never really worn rings, so I was like playing with it, and I dropped it between the seats. And Tabitha's like, already, you have lost the ring. And it was one of those moments I was like, okay, this is going to be a little bit tougher because I can't even seem to keep my wedding ring on 15 minutes after we've been married. And tonight we're talking about marriage. Uh, We've been in the series called uh, Love is a Battlefield. And we've been talking about what it looks like to have a a relationship that honors Jesus. And we've been walking through this series uh, step by step. Last week we talked about how to date. Uh, Tonight we're talking about marriage. And the reason we're talking about marriage is because many of us in this room are married. There's a lot of us in this room who want to be married. And many of us labor under the misconception that our marriages will be perfect if we just work hard enough. By the way, this is a new thing. This buzzing sound, I don't know if you're uh, with me on this. This has only started today. It's like this code blue thing. It's like really annoying, by the way, right? Sorry, that has nothing to do with the sermon. Just kind of want to just put that out there. That may be going on a bunch tonight until they fix that. All right. Going back to the sermon. Uh, when it comes to, okay, everybody looked at their phones. We're all good. We're all back. All right, cool. Uh, when it comes to our, uh, our weddings and our marriages, we all want them to be perfect, right? And the reason why is because marriage matters. And the people we marry matters. It matters to God. It matters to us. Our marriages are the most important relationship every single one of us will ever have. And we don't want to mess it up. Some of us have seen our families mess it up, right? We've seen our parents go through divorce, number one, maybe number two. Uh, Some of us have seen our friends and family go through it. Or we've just like uh, felt this deep desire to have a great marriage. And the good news is this, is that God wants you to have that. And so tonight we're going to talk about how to have one out of the scriptures. Because here's the deal. Nobody ever wanted to get into a marriage just because they had to, right? Nobody's like, hey, let's do a mediocre marriage. Like, you just want to try that? Like, let's just go through just a lot of hard times together. Let's kind of just kind of get stuck together. Let's just do this thing just as like mediocre as possible. No, every single one of us wants to have a great marriage. And I love my wife and I love our marriage. And it's been really great to journey together for these last 14 years. But let me just tell you, we haven't been perfect. We've messed up a lot. And so tonight, I come to you not by saying, hey, listen, my marriage is perfect, so listen to me on how we do this. But rather, we've just been down this road and made a lot of mistakes, and we realize that God is better, and he can do something really beautiful through our story if he lets us. And I'm also really privileged to have the opportunity to see my parents walk through this journey of life and marriage uh, they're they're uh, celebrating 49 years of marriage this year, and that is awesome. In fact, I was shocked. I was like, 49? Yeah, you guys can do that. We can clap, right? And so as I've just kind of seen a lot of people get married, done a lot of premarital counseling, I've done over 50 weddings, I've seen young couples make a lot of choices along the way. And uh, I've walked with them in their highs and their lows. And my hope for you is that you'll have the very best message, marriage you possibly can have, that you'll have the very best marriage of your life. And so whether you're married tonight or you're thinking about getting married or you're engaged, that tonight would be a night that you could have some tangible um, ideas to walk in 
Because here's the key idea I want you to walk away with tonight. Here it is, okay? Key idea. The key to marriage is pursuit, not perfection. The key in marriage is pursuit, not perfection. For many of us, we just think about perfection and we'll never find it. But marriages that last pursue each other. And we're gonna look at the very first marriage tonight on how Adam and Eve pursued one another and they pursued a marriage that lasted. Even though the world ended and broke around them, they were able to weather that storm and walk in their uh, love, even though the world ended all around them. So would you guys open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter two? We're gonna start in verse 18. Um, I'm gonna read the text to you. We're gonna walk through three ways of pursuit And we're starting verse 18, all the way to verse 25. So it says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal. Before the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place, and then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and bonds with his wife, and they will become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now, this is the very first wedding, the very first marriage. And what we find in the story is we find man, Adam, being created by God, and he's incredibly lonely. We talked about this at the factory when we had Kairos at the factory where the very first thing that God calls not good is loneliness. Up to that point, everything God had made, God said, this is good. He made the world that we live in. He said, this is good. He made the animals, made man. He said, all these things are good. But the one thing that wasn't good was the fact that Adam was alone. So God made Eve for him. And it's interesting to see how God tells the story because The first thing that God does when he creates Adam is he gives him a job. He says, I want you to name everything. Name all the animals. And as he's naming the animals, Adam realizes that none of the animals matches him. None of them match him. He's looking for community and he finds that no animal is right for him. And finally, in despair, he becomes deeply aware of his loneliness, and God then provides for him. And here's the thing I want you guys to hear tonight. As we're talking about marriage, you may be feeling loneliness because of the fact that you're single. And to that, I would just say two things. One, loneliness isn't just a single experience. People are married and feel loneliness at the same time. People can feel loneliness whether you're married or you are single or you have kids Loneliness is not reserved only for the single adult. And yet, there may be something within you drawing you towards marriage, and that's not a bad thing. And it may cause you some pain as you wait on the Lord. Adam had to wait, and God actually had him go through a season where he had a parade of options come through in front of him, and every single one of them was not suitable for them. And I love what Hannah, who was leading worship for us, she shared this tonight. I just thought this was too good to just not bring this into the message. But one of the things she said was that sometimes God brings people through your life, and they're not the right one, and you just have to be patient until the right one comes. And God even models this in this marriage uh, between Adam and Eve, and you may be feeling that tonight. And let me just say, that is absolutely normal. But don't settle on what's available Wait on God's best. Wait on what he has for you because it will always be right and worth it. If you have the patience to not just say, I'm going to jump after Mr. Right now instead of Mr. Right. And for you tonight, if you're struggling with being alone, just know this. Jesus knows what it feels like to be alone. He empathizes with you. He knows what loneliness is like. 
Because we know that from the scriptures. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in all ways that we are tempted. He was well acquainted with grief. He understands the way that you feel tonight. And you are not alone. And you are not alone in this place because we are for you. But we find three things in this story about pursuit. Pursuing, not, not perfection, but pursuing a person. And the first thing that we find here is we find pursuing oneness. And tonight, if you want to be someone who's married, or if you are married, the first step to living that out is pursuing oneness. And that's what you find Adam doing. Now, I would say this is a, something that's reserved for marriage, but if you want to know what a good marriage is, is fully formed in and what it's like based upon, it's these three pursuits we're talking about tonight. Pursuing oneness is the foundation to a marriage that lasts. And we find this in God's design for marriage in this very first marriage. We find that God creates Eve out of Adam, not out of the dirt, not out of thin air, but out of Adam himself because her end is being someone who's one with him. And she, form, she is formed not out of his head to rule over him or from his feet to be ruled by him, but from his side so that she will be close to him, so that she'll be near his heart, so that she'll walk alongside him, so that she can be one with him, not above or below, but with him. And marriage is a picture of oneness, choosing to be one. And we find the text actually telling us that in verse 24. If you guys want to look in verse 24, you find the narrator of the story. So it's the story of Adam being presented with Eve and saying, at last, here she is. But then you find the narrator stepping out and saying, this is what's going on. In verse 24, it says this. It says, this is why a man leaves his father and bonds with his wife, and they will become one flesh. Marriage is about becoming one with the other person. Now, oneness is not sameness. So sometimes we think about becoming one with somebody, we think we should become the same. We become codependent, we lose ourselves in them. That's not what the Bible is talking about. And if you're in a relationship that's going towards sameness, not oneness, then you need to really think about the direction of the relationship because the best relationships have unity without uniformity. Like you're united, but you're different. That you're united, that you, you see the world in the same way, you have the same desires, but you are different people. You're not codependent, but you're somebody that actually knows who you are and what you want. In fact, the very best relationships are the ones who fight. Now, you've never heard that in church, right? But the best relationships in marriages are the ones who actually have opinions on stuff. Because sometimes we think about relationships and we think that, man, if I'm going to have the perfect relationship, we're never going to fight. Hey, I got you, right? You think when relationships, man, the perfect relationship will never fight. But, but we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for pursuit. And when you have conflict in a relationship, it's healthy. Because what it means is that both parts of that relationship are both saying what they really think. Saying what they think and asking for it from their partner, and forging towards a new future. In fact, the most loving thing to do in a relationship is to actually say what you think about stuff and to ask for it. And then find somebody who's willing to say, yes, I'm willing to meet you halfway, or I'm willing to negotiate, I'm willing to engage with conflict so that we can find greater oneness and unity. And I think one of the things that's hard for a lot of couples and people when they're dating is to find ways to disagree and fight fair and to walk through that in a way that honors Jesus. To pursue each other and pursue each other's mind and their heart and pursue oneness without becoming exactly like the person and losing themselves in it. So if you want to have a healthy relationship, one of the best things you can do is simply know who you really are so that you can give yourself to somebody else. So if you're single in this room and you want to be married at some point, one of the best things you can do is actually figure out what you like and who you are. Because you can't give yourself to somebody else if you don't know that. You will lose yourself in them and you will no longer be able to contribute to the relationship at your fullest because you simply have become a shadow of the other person. So oneness is the goal. Now, there's some, some things that will hold us back from oneness, okay? So I'm just going to come through three things that keep you from oneness in a relationship. 
The first one is just life, busyness. Sometimes you can be so busy that you don't have time to become one with somebody else. And a marriage should be two people saying, we're going to become one in all aspects of our life. So we're going to be one spiritually, emotionally, relationally, physically, and financially. You should be one in all these ways. If you're going to be one, you will pursue the same story, the same narrative. There's no plan B for us to split up our assets if this doesn't work. It's saying we're going to be one. Our stories are entwined. We're going to be one forever. There's no other option for us. And we are pursuing this oneness as a couple. But one of the things that can pull people aside from that is just how busy we are. Because all of us get busy and we stop pursuing intimacy. And busyness is the enemy of intimacy. Every time, when we get super busy, we can't be close to somebody else. So if you want to have a relationship that is one with the other person, you have to find ways to connect. So Tabitha and I, we try to call each other every time at lunch when we're away from one another. Why? Because I love talking to my girl. I like spending time with her. I want to know how bad her day was or how good it was, but that's something we do so we can pursue connection. The second thing we do is every time we come home after not seeing each other, so if we're at work or we've been away, we take the first 15 minutes and we say, that is holy ground. We don't do anything other than look at each other and talk to one another. Why? Because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves three hours later watching TV and not having connected or talked to each other at all. It takes work to pursue somebody. So whether you're dating or you're married or you're engaged, just know you don't pursue somebody by accident. You have to pursue them intentionally. And if someone's not pursuing you like that, you need to talk to them about it. Say, like, why aren't we pursuing this kind of relationship with intentionality? Because if we don't, this thing's going to crumble. We have to pursue each other with Intentionality, or else it won't happen at all. So that's one. Time. Second, our relationships. Here's the deal. Every single person needs healthy relationships of the same gender. You need to have male friendships if you're a guy. You need to have female friendships if you're a girl. But when you actually get married, you also need to make sure that your person is your person. Okay? So one of the things I think is funny in our story is, like, I didn't really learn this Right off the bat, and Tabitha, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell the story. But uh, when we were like first married, we got stuck on a layover, and I was so frustrated because they kept on pushing our plane back, and we were like walking through the, the airport, and we were all hot and sweaty, and I was just like so mad. And my default had been when I was really upset or frustrated, I'd call my roommate Steve. So Tabitha and I were like walking through, and I'm just like frustrated at the moment. I just want to escape, and I said, "Hold on," I said, "I need to call Steve because he makes me happy." Let me just tell you, that was the wrong thing to say. Okay. <laughs> Like, I don't, I'm not a rocket scientist here, but like telling my wife that the somebody else makes me happy and is my buddy, that's not going very well for me. And I'd never have made that mistake ever again. Why? Because I know that the person who should make me happy and I should go to is who? Tabitha, right? We all nod this way. Because if I don't, I'm going to be finding my solace and my comfort in people who's not my spouse. So we need to make sure that we continue to drive deeper relationally, not forsaking other friendships, but drive deeper because at some point our people are going to be, uh, our, our person, the person we're married to, has to be the primary person that we go to when things are incredibly difficult. And lastly, the thing that can hold us back is our families. See, everybody who's married comes from a culture, and every one of us is blind to that culture. It's like a fish swimming in water. We, we live in a culture that is just part of the scenery for us. We don't know the dysfunctions that our family has brought down among us. And what the Bible tells us here in verse 24 is that oneness means leaving behind your father and your mother and bonding with your spouse. I'm just telling you that it's so much harder than it sounds. But if you pursue oneness with somebody, you have to say, listen, mom and dad, great. But you know what? We are all messed up. So we're going to take the best and we're going to leave the rest behind and start a new story. Some of you are thinking right now about your life. You've, you've gone through some stuff. And you probably, one of the best things you can do if you're thinking about marriage someday is to start thinking right now, like what things do I need to leave behind and what things do I need to preserve so that I can be the very best spouse for my my, my bride or my, my husband. 
So that's the first thing, pursuing oneness. The second is to pursue love. So pursue oneness. Second, pursue love. In Genesis 2.25, we find something that makes us giggle, right? Some of you guys read this, you're like, ooh, we're we going to talk about that? It says this, it says, both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now, a lot of us are like, oh, public nudity, that's weird, right? Like, <laughs> some of us have had dreams where we were like, we, our clothes are gone, and we're like really ashamed. We all cover up because we know it's, it's proper for us to do that. And yet here in, in, in the garden, you find Adam and Eve are naked and they're unashamed. And many of us live our entire life filled with shame. So we don't understand what this really means. But what you find in this story is something beautiful. Adam and Eve model marriage in the fact that they are fully known and fully loved. I... I, I just think that this is a staggering description of marriage where somebody looks at you and says, listen, I see you and I see the parts of you that you don't like and I love you anyway. Listen, think about your own life. There are parts of your, your life and your story, your past that you may go, man, I just like don't want anybody to know that. There may be parts of your physical body that you're like, I just don't, I just don't feel very confident in this. There may be parts of, of the way that you feel when you're around people that are certain ways that you're like, man, I just feel really awkward around them. And if somebody sees it, you feel vulnerable and, 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 and unlovable. And what's beautiful about marriage is that if you marry the right person who's committed to you, you get to recover Eden just a little bit when you get there. That person can look at you and say, you know what? I see you. Because here's the thing, in marriage... You can't hide. Like, they, they know when you're lying. They, they, my wife says this to me sometimes. She goes, I've been married to you a long time. You can't get away with that with me, okay? So they look at you and they go, I see you. But the beauty is when somebody looks at you and says, I see you and I'm not going anywhere because I love you anyway. What a gift. And the only way you can do that is by being somebody who's willing to let others in. To let others in. To say, you know what? You can get in my mess, and I will be vulnerable with you because when I do, I get to recover Eden just a little bit. I get to pursue love, and I'm able to see just a picture of the gospel in my story in this relationship. I remember Tabitha doing that for me. You know, um, I, I <laughs> got something to tell you guys. Like, I've always been very subconscious about my hair. I don't know why. I just hated it college I wore a hat every day people thought I was bald because they'd never seen me without a hat on and uh one day they're like actually you have hair under there that's really interesting I was like yeah I just hate my hair uh and uh uh I met Tab and like we started like connecting and this is the funny thing she was like I love your hair and I was like you what this this hair and she's like, no, I actually love it. I love how it's curly. And she loved all the parts of my hair that I hated. And I was like, I was most like, ugh, about. She was like, no, I love that. And so that love opened up a lot of possibilities for me. In fact, I started like growing mutton chops. I was like, let's just let it go wild. If you like it, let's just let it go crazy. Why? Because like I feel seen and known and loved. And that's what I hope for you. If you get to be in a place with somebody who sees you, knows you, and loves you anyway, that's a, just a powerful gift but you have to pursue it. You can't just fall into it. You have to pursue it. And part of the pursuit is just saying, I know your imperfections, and we're not looking for perfect. We're looking for each other. Which brings us to the last piece, which is to pursue Christ. And I like asking a question about the text, and I like asking every, every Bible passage that I read, I like to say, where is Jesus in this? And this is Genesis 2, so it's like so far before Jesus, right? Like, so you can go, where is Jesus in this story? Like, how can we find Jesus in this, in this passage of Scripture? It's Adam and Eve getting, getting made. And, and how can we even see what, what the gospel is about in this story? But what's fascinating is the very next verse after the story of Adam and Eve being known and loved is we find Satan entering into the story. And Adam and Eve falling and sinning against God, and their marriage becomes not just a safe place anymore. It becomes a place where they begin to lie and steal, and murder enters into the history of the world in the very next generation. 
And what's powerful about this story is that this story is the backdrop of the gospel message. You see, Jesus came because Adam and Eve couldn't do it on their own. And what the Bible tells us about Jesus is that he's actually the second Adam. He's the better Adam. And his marriage that he's establishing will be one that will overturn all the mess and junk and hurt that Adam and Eve experienced and unleashed in the world. And that's the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus gives us a better way. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this. He says about marriage because he talks about husbands and wives and loving one another like Christ gave himself for the church. And he says this. He says, this mystery is profound. Speaking of marriage, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And what you need to hear tonight is that marriages that last are not built on how beautiful people are or how funny they are or how much money they have or how much they get one another. Those are all human ways of finding perfection in marriage. The best marriages are the ones who pursue Jesus and build their marriage upon him. Why? Because every friendship is ultimately about something. It's about looking at something and saying, this is worth it. So I met this dude today for coffee. Um, I met him for coffee because I thought uh, we were going to be meeting for coffee on Thursday, but he texted me. He was like, hey, it's today. I was like, shoot. So I like packed everything up, rolled into Herbin Market. It's my favorite place to get coffee here in, 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 in Brentwood, Franklin area. And uh, rolled up there, and I'd never met this guy in my life before, and we just hit it off. Why? Because we were both wearing Jordans. He was like, dude, Jordans. And then we went to the counter, and we ordered the exact same drink. Americano, ice, oat milk, two shots of vanilla. And we're like, wow, you too. You also know the secret drink of the summer. And then we started talking, and we realized we're like, spent a lot of time in the same area, and we have a lot of the same friends. And it was just like, wow. You like all the same stuff I do. This is incredible. And here's the deal. Marriages are like that. You meet somebody, you're like, wow, you like all the same stuff I do. This is great. But ultimately, everything else will fade and will be a foundation that will not last if it's not Jesus. And the best marriages are the ones when people come together and they say, you know what? I really think it's incredible. I think Jesus is. And let's point our life upon him. You like that too? Let's pursue him together. And the reason why that matters is because when Jesus is the foundation, everything else figures itself out. You start realizing the things that really matter in life. You start having the same values when it comes to having kids or raising a family. And the most incredible part is that you get Jesus on your side. You see, the hardest part about marriage is conflict, pursuing one another. But what I love about marriages that are based on Jesus is that they bring the Holy Spirit into that marriage. And sometimes you just need the Holy Spirit to do his work in your spouse's life. And here's the deal. When it comes to the pursuit of Christ, that doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't just happen when you first meet the person. It happens now. So, the best advice I can have for you tonight, if you're married, is to pursue Jesus with your spouse. If you're single tonight, the very best thing that you can do tonight is to make a decision to pursue Jesus now. And to start knowing him and loving him and seeking after him and look at somebody else that also says, I love him too. And say, okay, let's see where this thing can go. Because that was a foundation that'll last. And it's not going to be perfect, but you're going to bring the one who is perfect into the middle of the relationship and build your life upon him. So in closing tonight, man, listen, we are all going to make a lot of mistakes. Can we just like say that out loud? Like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up in my marriage tonight. Like, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to hurt my wife's feelings or I'm going to let myself down. But the beauty is that it's not really about me. It's about Jesus. And the same thing is true for you. You may, you may make a ton of mistakes in your relationship or until you meet the right one. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus wants to be with you. And so as we talk about marriage, I think one of the best things we can do to close out with our 120 seconds tonight is just simply to pray for our spouse or future spouse. Like honestly, how much time have we really done uh, that recently? To actually take time and pray for our spouse, if you're married, to lift them up before Jesus and say, Jesus, they're yours, and I want to pursue them, but I need you to walk with me as I do that. Would you just care for them? Will you bless them? 
For those who are single, the best thing you can do is start saying, God, I, I, I know that they're out there somewhere. And I will wait until you bring them to me, even if it takes a long time. And I'm naming a lot of other things that are not it. I'm going to wait until you bring the right person because you know what's best. And until then, I'm going to pursue you with everything I got. So let's just take a moment. I'm going to invite the band up. And we're going to take our time of 120 seconds where we're just still and quiet before the Lord and just like say, God, would you just, would you just like give me eyes to see the person? Would you just be with them right now? Would you just, would you just care for my spouse? Would you just be with them? And as we enter into that time, I just want to just pray over you. Is that okay? Jesus, my brothers and sisters in this room are absolutely beloved by you. You're crazy about them. And you know their story and you care about their love life and you care about who they marry and you care about them. And... That is remarkable. And yet, Jesus, I pray that as we take this time just to sit in this, would you just give us a sense of your your presence, whether we're married or single, that you're with us, and that even though we may be facing either obstacles in our relationship or no relationship at all, you've promised that you would walk alongside us. And even more than that, you're going to pursue us because you love us so much.